anything on now, and that really doesn't take a lot of if you've got a Bible there, can you uh, just get ready? We're gonna we've been talking about faith for a number of weeks now, and we're kind of getting towards the back end of, of that. I think we've probably spent eight, nine weeks talking about different aspects of faith, and just trying to break faith down and, and keep it as simple uh, as possible. And uh, we've, we've got a couple of weeks to go on that. And um, so if you, if you kind of feel like you're jumping in mid-story here, you can go back. We've got a, a, a YouTube channel there. You can jump on and look uh, and, and, and sort of catch up if you're interested in knowing a bit more about the foundation we've laid. I want to continue that journey uh, a little bit this morning of talking about faith. And uh, I want to share a story with you first before I, I do. And I just came across this. Any, any um, um, African, South African people here? I know we do have some. Yeah. Well, I came across this on the, in the Ghana News. Actually, the story, and apparently it happened uh, about a year or two years ago. They said a church leader had his buttocks mauled by a lion. You find that funny? <laughs> Everybody reach out towards Ruth. <laughs> well, I found it funny too, that's why I'm sharing it, I'll just confess. A church leader had his buttocks mauled by a lion after running towards a pride in a bid to prove the Lord's power over animals. Alec Denawe a Zion Christian Church prophet, was attacked on a safari while trying to show that God would save him in front of fellow church members. He said, he is said to have fallen into a trance and started speaking in tongues before charging at a pride of lions, feeding on an impala in South Africa's Kruger National Park. But as Mr. Dewane sprinted towards them, the lions immediately viewed him as prey and zeroed in on him. Realising that the Lord wasn't about to help, Mr. Dewane fled back to the car, but not before one of the lions clamped down on his buttocks. He was only saved from the few, from further injury or possible death when the game ranger fired shots to scare the lions off, it was reported. Now he said when interviewed afterwards, I do not know what came over me. I thought the Lord wanted to use me to show his power over animals. It's not, uh, uh, is it not we were given dominion over all creatures of the earth, Mr. Dewane said. He was rushed to hospital for emergency surgery to stitch up his wounds, and he was later discharged. Now that, my friends, is a bummer of the day. <laughs> Just had to throw that one in there. How many of you have heard stories, stories like this, or maybe you have been the one, if we're humble enough to pop out, don't put your hand up, but maybe you've been the one where we've taken a, a promise of God or something that we assumed was a promise of God, a, a, what I'll call a universal promise, which means a promise that's applicable to all believers at all times, doesn't matter where you are or what your circumstance is. How many of us have stepped out in faith on something that we presumed was a promise of God only to find out later on when we either had egg on our face or mud on our hands or a, a lion's jaws around our butt cheeks, that it wasn't exactly a promise of God. Has anyone ever done anything like that? I'm sure that I've got stories. I'm not going to share them with you because you'll leave the church and think this guy's an idiot, so I'll keep them to myself. But I'm sure I've had moments like Mr. Dewane here where we stepped down on something that we presumed was a promise of God only to find out that it actually wasn't a promise of God. What I find uh, uh, sad about stories like this, and we would, you would know exactly where I'm going with this, how many times have we seen these kinds of things enacted only to realise that not just does that individual end up with egg on their face, but all of us get blasted, don't we? The whole church look like nitwits. The whole church look like fools and idiots. It's, it's reported that that person did it, but we all get tarred with the brush, that we're just loose cannons and you know we, we're hyper this and hyper that and so on. And, and and this is not an isolated uh, situation. Uh, I remember when we were missionaries in India many years back, and we did some work with, there was a Canadian evangelist there. And this Canadian evangelist had come over, and he was a nice guy. It's not a, a, a go at him. He was a great guy and a nice guy. But I remember, and Marie would have been there, uh, uh, Mark, uh, your daughter was there. <laughs> and what happened was, this guy came in and he did a series of, of um, uh, big crusades. But then during the day, he had small teams that went around to slum areas. And they went into one slum area, and they went up to a family whose child was on medication. And they prayed for the child, and then they told the parents, the Lord's healed them, you need to have faith and stop the medication, right? Now, I, I, I'm sure you all know exactly where I'm going with this. The, 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 the prophet, the evangelist, whoever it was, they weren't doctors, and, and so please, please, I'm not having a go, I'm just saying this is what happened. They told them to go off their medication, and so they took their child off that medication. Within a few days, the child died. 
And so it was then reported all over the newspapers, here we are in India trying to, to, to do good things in the name of Jesus and share the love of God with these people. And you can imagine how we all ended up looking when splashed on the front page of the, the Nagpur newspaper was the story about this little girl that had died because the Christians had told her, stop taking your medication based on some kind of promise like by his stripes were healed. I'm sure we've all got stories of presumption or heard of stories where people have stepped out in presumption and there's been all kinds of catastrophes that have taken place. And the biggest catastrophe for me is that it's situations like that that lead to people ending up with shipwrecked faith. Their faith gets shipwrecked. Now, should it or should it not? Should they have a stronger basis for their faith than that? Yes, I completely agree. Now, let me also say, do I believe in healing? 110% I believe in healing. Uh, Our time in India, we saw many, many people healed. Uh, My time in Australia, I've got many testimonies of praying for people in Australia and seeing miraculous healings even in our country here. So I believe in healing. I'm not saying that story to say God doesn't heal. What I'm trying to say is that in those two situations, we we made a presumption upon the Word of God and, put our, and there's a difference between making presumption and actually having faith. There's a difference between presuming God will do something and actually having faith, a proper grounded real faith and knowing what it is that God said he would do as opposed to just presuming upon God that he will do something that you want him to do. And many people's faiths are shipwrecked because we move into the area of presumption and we actually move out of the area of faith. Now, here's the thing. If, if you had a, a, a working knowledge, right, of or a basic knowledge of the Bible. These, these 66 ancient documents that have been written across a period of 1,500 years and have been combined together in, in what we call the Bible now. It's not one book, it's 66 books written over a long period of time. It's just all stuck in the one volume. And, and I like to repeat that because it's a reminder to us that it's not just a book. Okay, it's not just a book. These pages don't just contain words or good sayings. This is the Word of God. This is something that the Holy Spirit moved upon men over a period of 1,500 years. The Spirit of God moved upon them. They penned this stuff. Well, they didn't pen it. They charcoaled it or flinted it or whatever they did back in the day. But they put it down on parchment. And then for whatever reason, for 2,000 years, there have been countries, nations, people have tried to destroy this book, remove it completely. Yet the Holy Spirit has used men and women of God. And throughout the ages, it's been preserved. And now here we are where it's suddenly become the biggest selling book of all time and we've all got copies of it and so on. But it's not just the biggest selling book of all time. It's not just a book. These words are powerful. These words are the very thoughts and intentions in the very heart of God that have been given to us so that in 2022 we can have a framework for who God is. We can have a framework for how God operates. We can have a framework that kind of keeps us on track and on the same lane as God. Because without that, how many of you know, especially in a, in a, in a spiritual age, uh, we could get all kinds of crazy stuff happening. And, and we, we, we already do. We have all kinds of crazy stuff happening because we stray from the train tracks of the Word of God. And we think that this... I've got friends of ours many, many, many years ago. And um, Jackie was a hairdresser by trade. And I remember uh, uh, one, one time she was cutting this guy's hair on the YWAM base in Brisbane and we were leading a school of evangelism. So this is a second level school. These are meant to be really mature you know, staff and mature people. <laughs> and I remember this staff member sitting there getting a haircut and Jackie's cutting his hair and then beginning to tell Jackie how him and this other guy were just over at the park. There's this big park right on the main road, Sam, uh, uh, is Sanford Road, Sanford Road there at Mitchelton, right there in the middle of the park with kids coming from, and walking around. And they were, were just overawed about the fact that they were walking along. And all of a sudden, one of them, he said, we, we, we went into a bubble of God's glory. And we were just in the bubble. And we would laugh. And, and then he said, I'd jump out of the bubble and I'd be normal again. But then I'd jump back into the bubble and I'd laugh. And then I'd jump out of the bubble. And he said, we had a great time. We were just there. And I'm trying to picture this going like two grown men. Standing there in a park, public place, cars, bus, and, and you're jumping in, going, Ooh, and then jumping out, and then jumping in and jumping out. There's just something about, it reminds me of the kids coming in and going up the back in the crèche and playing with their toys. That's the kind of the image that I got. And, and, and so when I go back to the Word of God, I'm not saying that, that, that please don't hear me, I'm not going to say that God can't, but I'm going to say that generally speaking, based on the way God works, I don't know that God just wants to make a bubble and me jump in a bubble and have a funny laugh and jump out of a bubble and jump in. Do I believe in all the manifestations? Yes. Do I believe God can do anything? Yes, I do. But some stuff just gets weird, doesn't it? Some stuff just gets plain weird. 
And when we get too far over into the weed, we end up with shipwrecked faith. We end up with people doing things with, that has no basis of God's backing or support, but they proclaim it's God, then it doesn't come through. Who looks bad? Well, we blame God. It's God. Now, if we spend a bit of time in the Word of God, here's, here's something that we would have known about that situation of, of telling a guy to go away and to throw away their medication and so on. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures, and I'm not talking about healing. I want to get to my point in a second. I'm just laying a foundation. In 1 Timothy 5.23... Timothy gets told by Paul, take some wine for your stomach problems. I don't know what it was. He had some kind of ailment going on. He said, take a little bit of wine for your stomach problems. People will debate, was the wine back then fermented? Was it not? Well, if you study it out, yeah, apparently it was. It might not have been as high, but, but it, was. it was. It was fermented and it was there. And Paul says to him, take the wine. Now, I don't want to talk about the wine. What I want to do is, why didn't Paul just say, hey, by his stripes you're healed? You're a believer, Timothy. Just stand on the promises of God and you don't need any... You just. But he didn't, because somewhere in Paul's psyche, there was probably the understanding as well. Okay, look, yes, Paul believed in healing. Nobody did more miraculous healings and signs and wonders than the Apostle Paul. Yet Paul's advice to Timothy in this situation, I don't know why. All I know is he said it, and for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit wanted it recorded to say, hey, well, you know, maybe not every time, you know, just stand on the Word of God and, 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 and that'll be enough. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul tells us that he ended up in Galatia and they heard the gospel because of he, had, he had some kind of illness. Now, you get, there's debates amongst theologians. What was that? Was it this? Was it that? Some people say he was beaten before he got to Galatia. But if you, and he was. He was beaten very severely before he ended up. Uh, 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 sorry, he got beaten very fiercely in Galatia. That's the, the problem. A lot of people will say that he got beaten, that he went to Galatia, and then he's saying, I was there because of illness, because I was beaten really badly. But again, if you actually look at the word of God and study it out, look at the context, he was beaten in Galatia. Um, so that doesn't make sense to me. But what he does say is this, I ended up with you for some kind of illness. He actually says, you guys would have gouged your eyes out and given them to me if you were able to. So some people think he had what they call optimalia, this thing of the eyes. We don't know. But again, my point is this, that Paul's saying I wasn't doing too well, but hey, at the end of the day, I ended up there and I got the gospel to these, these people. So again... Now, Paul, if, if you believe that this was all just 100% a given, and this is what we're talking about, universal givens, if this was a universal given for everyone, Paul, then you shouldn't have been sick because you had more revelation than anybody else. Philippians 2.27, Paul talks about Epaphroditus, this traveling companion that he had. And he says that Epaphroditus, he says Epaphroditus almost died. And then he says this, he says, but God had mercy on him, but not only on him, on me too. So he actually refers to Epaphroditus being healed by God as an act of mercy. He says it was mercy. He doesn't say that, that, no, this was his right and he's given as a child of God and he's just... Stand no, he said this was an act of mercy that he healed here. It was an act of mercy. In James chapter 5, verse 14, James doesn't say if there's any sick among you, just stand on the promises of God. He says, no, 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 call for the elders of the church they'll anoint you with them, and they'll pray for you. The point I'm making is this, that I believe 100% in healing. If you are sick, my first response is to want to pray for you. If, if you are sick, I'm going to encourage you to believe God for healing. But at the same time, theologically, if I want to be a, 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 align myself up with the word of God, I also know that there's a mystery aspect to God, and I'm not God where I just tell you. I, I don't know. I'm going to tell you, always believe in faith, but if it doesn't happen, don't end up with a shipwrecked faith and say God didn't do what he promised. He didn't promise that every time 100% was going to happen. And if we want to have a solid faith and a fruit-bearing faith, we've got to be aware of what, is, what, what, what can we actually lay our faith on and stand on and what is getting into the realm of pre presumption. Because we don't want to presume upon God because presumption upon God leads to shipwrecked faith. I cannot tell you how many people I've sat down in my years as a pastor who have walked with God, had a shipwrecked moment, and they'll blame some theological thing that they were taught or that they assumed would happen. God will provide all my needs. Well, I had this need and I gave all this money away and God didn't give me and now I'm bankrupt and it's God's fault. Your faith is shipwrecked on the basis of what? God will provide all your needs. Yes, he will, but let's keep it in context. And if you read the word of God and understood the broader context, you would understand at the same time as God says, be generous and give to everybody, he also says, use wisdom. He also says, be led by the spirit. Don't just everybody. There's so many nuances to this 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 uh, walk with God. And we just want to make sure that what we're standing on and believing for, that we can do it with a foundation of faith and we know that we know this particular thing is either A, a universal promise of God or B, a personal promise of God. Is it a universal promise of God 
Or is this a personal promise of God? Romans 10, 17 says this. It says, in the New King James, and we would all know it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Now, let me give you just a little Greek uh, word study here. How many of you heard that it's easy in the Greek, you break it down, the word rhema means the spoken Word of God and the word logos means written. Who's ever been taught that? Yep, nearly all of us have come across that. Now, I just want to tell you that if you actually do a proper word study on those two words, it's actually not right. Sorry, but it's not. The word logos and the word rhema are very interchangeable in the Greek depending on who's writing. Paul uses rhema uh, a certain way. John uses the word rhema a certain way. They both use logos a different way. Matthew does. And, and so when people read this verse, here's what they'll say. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God because it's the word rhema that gets used there. And so what that lends us to then is to think the only way you really get faith is when God spiritually speaks something into your spirit and, and, and so on, and it negates the power and the authority of the actual written word of God. It almost makes it second rate to the rhema. But I want to let you know, in the Greek in the New Testament, if you study it out properly, those two words are interchangeable. So we can't, there's no point sitting there going that one type of word is more faith building and more important than another type of word. Now you can believe that if you want, but I'm just encouraging you, do a word study and you will find that that's poor theology, it's not right. The point is this, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then, then faith comes to me by hearing uh, uh, the universal truths of God, the, this word of God, it comes by hearing what God has said and by, comes by hearing what God is saying. So faith comes to me by hearing what God has said. I, I should be in this word. I should be in this book. I should be spending time in it. And I bang on about this every single week, and there's a reason why I do it. There's a reason why I do it. You know, current studies have shown that... Put, put your hand up in this room if you're sort of uh, 18 and under. Put your hand up for me. Just straight up in the air. One, straight up. No, don't, don't be half-hearted. Own your age. Own it, baby. We all wish we were you. Hands up. Nice and high. Hands up nice and high. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Okay, sweet. <laughs> now, I'm speaking to everyone, but I'm, I'm really speaking to you, so I want your attention. I want you to listen to me. Studies have shown that only 4%, roughly 4% of your age group read the Bible daily anymore. 4%. This is the basis. This is where we get most of our, 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 our faith foundation. This is where we learn about the train tracks of faith. 4% of you guys, statistically, in this country, these are Australian stats, 4% of you read your Bible on any daily basis. 7 out of 10 of you don't even read it, period. Don't even read it, period. We, we, we want to build a strong faith. For 2,000 years of church history, this has been a really, really important part of people's walk and journey with God. I don't know whether it's because we think that we're a more sophisticated, advanced society now that we can do so much more better than they used to be able to do years ago. And it's true, can't we? I mean, we can put a man on the moon. We can press a button and cook an egg in 30 seconds. We can boil water at the flick of a switch. We can, we can chuck words that don't, aren't written down anywhere up on screen. We can, do all, we can play a guitar up here and you can hear it a thousand miles away. Like we, can, we can do so many things. We are so advanced technologically and so on. And maybe, maybe that's crept a bit into our spiritual uh, faith life as well, where we feel like we've, we've kind of moved beyond the old ways of doing things. Anyone ever feel like that? We've moved beyond the old ways of doing things. That's why you know, even singing that song, it's kind of like, no, we've moved beyond those old songs. We, we, we've moved beyond you know? But, but it's interesting because for two, basically the best part of 2,000 years of church history, this was really, really important and integral to people's faith. It's almost like maybe we feel spiritually we've moved on beyond that. We can now have a faith we don't need that anymore. We've got a new way of doing faith. You just, you just send me a verse in my inbox every now and then. And if I have time, I'll read it because I've got about another 50 emails in that inbox too. And let's be honest with each other, we don't read them all. I'm subscribed to lots of different ministries and stuff. They're sending me their content, probably saying, yeah, he's another reader. I don't read it, sorry. <laughs> Wish I was more, but no, there's just too much there now, you know? But for 2,000 years, the church built strong people. People built strong faith, faith that endured crises, faith that endured world wars, faith that endured plagues, not only endured, but rose above them and, and powered on and built the church, faith that endured persecution, uh, faith that endured martyrdom. 
And I almost sometimes wonder, do we feel like we've moved a bit beyond that? We don't need this anymore because, you know, we've, we're, I mean, we're modern believers, man. We've, you know, we're a bit more sophisticated and a bit more, you know. Yet faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So hearing is two things. The word of God is two things. One, what has God said? What has God said? That requires time in, this, in these ancient documents. It requires time in these ancient documents. And I know, and I know, and I know that we all think we're time poor. We are not a time poor generation. We have more residual spare time than any generation has ever had. How do I know that? Because it takes you three minutes, 30 seconds to cook an egg. It took my grandparents 10. It took 20 minutes to boil the water to make a coffee. Now it takes you two. It took 25 minutes in a horse and cart to get to church. It takes you three minutes. It took a week for me to get a message from me to Leslie because I had to write it down on the aerogram and send it to her. Now I type a click a button, she gets it straight away. We are, don't buy into the lie that we are time poor. We're not time poor, we're just so much more distracted with so many other things that occupy that time. And we've got to be serious and ask ourselves, if we want a strong faith, is this important enough that we would take time for it? We've never been in a generation where it's easier to get a hold of a Bible reading plan. If you like a Bible reading plan, you can get online and print out a Bible reading plan. You don't have to spend an hour a day. For some of us, if we spent five minutes a day, that would be a great start. And we would begin to feel the benefits of that, wouldn't we? We'd begin to feel faith rising in our hearts. And, and once we begin to feel that, that faith rising, once we, once we start to get a bit of momentum, for some of us, you've just got to get the car in first gear. And just, just, just get going in first gear. And once you get going in first gear, then you know, you'll, you'll find that you'll want to probably get into second. And then maybe eventually you want to get into third. But we've got to start somewhere, don't we? So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing what God has said. Then, of course, the second part of that is not only what God has said, but now what God is saying. What is God saying to you now? What is God speaking to you about your life right now? Do you think that God has any interest in your world today? Do you think that God cares about the hurt or the suffering or the pain you're going through? Do you think that the God of the universe may, just may, have some answers and some things that he'd like to say to you? Do you think he's got some things he'd like to drop into your spirit if maybe we'd learn to take time and slow down and listen? Even, even just start by praying and asking the questions. Asking solutions. Asking for direction. Do we feel like God's interested enough in us? Because faith comes by hearing the word of God, and that's twofold. That's hearing what he has said, but also on a daily basis, hearing what he is saying. What is God saying to you about your season of life or your stage of life right now? I, I, I love the story of the seven sons of Sceva. I think it's Acts 19. You know the seven sons of Sceva? Anyone you know that story, yeah? The, 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 these Jewish exorcists that went and found a fellow with a demon. They were going around going, in the name of, of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, we cast you out, you know? And it says this demon turned around and looked at him and goes, yeah, Jesus I know. And, and Paul I'm very well acquainted with too because he's a mate of Jesus and they've got relationship. But who do you think you are? And then it says he, this guy turned around and beat the tar out of this group of... It says they ran out of the place naked and bleeding. Now that's a bad day. Hey? That's a bad day. That's worse than having a lion clamp on your buttocks. That's worse than that. You see, because they were running around claiming, well, of course, we, we all have, we have power and authority, don't we? All authority in heaven and earth I give to you. You'll, you'll, you'll raise the dead, cast out demons freely. I've given freely. So they're running around doing this. But you know what they didn't have? They had this promise. They had this word. But they didn't have any relationship with God for which that promise then became applicable to them. They didn't have any relationship with God. Well, you, you see, for faith to come, the two biggest elements, I believe, for faith to come into me, for me to hear what God has to say, the two biggest elements that I need to come to terms with is one, I need the word of God in my life, and two, I need a personal relationship with Jesus. I need a personal relationship with him. Some of us want one without the other. Some people want a personal relationship with Jesus and their faith's based on that. Well, the problem with that is, yeah, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, but if you don't have the train tracks and the rails to know what's God and what's not, and if every spiritual thing that happens to you, you lump under the basket of that was Jesus, that was the Holy Spirit, you end up loopy and weird. I've got a really great, great mate of mine, and I've shared this with a few of you. Uh, his name was Alan. Please don't judge the name. I'm Alan too. It's 
but he was a different Alan. And we used to work together in a youth group in Bundaberg. And Alan decided <coughs> that uh, he was a normal guy, a couple of kids, wife, great marriage, great guy. Anyway, he went through this season where what he did is he began to isolate himself from other people. He started uh, getting up in the morning and going into a room of his house, closing the door, saying to his wife he was going to work. And he'd sit in this room and then he would watch. And again, I'm not bagging. It's got nothing to do with the individuals. But he would just sit there and watch Joyce Meyer, then Creflo Dollar, then Kenneth Hagen, uh, Kenneth Goble. He just watched them. Watch, and he did this all day. And he would just sit there and, and, and then he started having these experiences with God. And then before you know it, cut a long story short, he ended up walking around Bundaberg, knocking on the doors of the pastors in town and going up to them and saying, I'm here because the Apostle Paul appeared to me in a vision and gave me a revelation to give you. Well, it wasn't long before he had a straight jacket wrapped around him literally and was thrown in the loony bin. Thrown in the loony bin. This guy, we worked alongside him. Soul of the earth guy, really, really good guy. But he laid that down and just decided to go after the experiences. And before you know it, he ended up getting weird and wonderful and wacky, and there's another shipwrecked faith. But then you've got other people, though, hey, we, we, it's just so this, 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 and we're not open to, to the reality of the fact that, you know what, not only do I need to know the Word of God, but I need a relationship with a God that lives with me today, walks with me today, speaks with me today, loves me today, has plans and purposes for my life. Jesus said that when the Spirit comes, He'll guide you into truth. When the Spirit comes, He'll speak to you my words. He'll let you know what I'm thinking. He talked about having this ongoing relationship with Himself through the Holy Spirit that indwells us as well. And so if, if we're only locked into this and we're totally shut off to anything else, then you know what? Here's the thing. I wouldn't be married because I cannot find a verse that says, thou shalt marry Jackie Munster. <laughs> Never found it. So Jackie, I'm sorry. Null and void. It's over. You know? I, 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 you're not going to find a verse that's going to say, thou shalt go to this city or that city. And, uh, I mean, unless it's an ancient Middle Eastern city, like, you know, it's in there. Thou shalt go to Tarsus or whatever. Um, but outside of that, you're not going to find that. You're not going to find uh, a, a verse in there that says, thou shalt go to QU, uh, T University or whatever the places are that your kids are going to go. It's not going to be, you're not going to find that. It's not going to be in there. Unless you wrote it in or your parents really want you to be close to home, so they write Southern Cross Lismore. And you're silly enough to go, that looks like original print. Yeah, the Lord has spoken. So we need both. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing what God has said, but also hearing and being open to what God is currently saying to us as well. Faith comes both ways. Um, that's not completely what I wanted to share this morning, but I just have this urge in my spirit this morning to push you to this. I don't know why. I just feel like we need to get into this, people. We, we, we need to not neglect the Word of God in our own lives. Amen? And we need to also not neglect what the Spirit of God is saying to us in obedience to that. Because here's, here's a thought. I'll leave you with this thought. As crazy and as ludicrous it is to hear stories of people who stepped out in faith on promises God never made, it's just as crazy to not step out in faith on promises God has made. And let me tell you something, until you get into this, you probably don't realise a lot of the promises that God has made. I think that's just as crazy. Amen? I think it's just as crazy. The challenge for you and me is this. Normally this would be the point where maybe I'd open up the Bible and give you a list of all the promises of God. And maybe if you're a note taker, you'd write them down and then you'd never look at your notes again because most of us don't. I'm just being honest. We, we do this 52 times a year. <laughs> I know we do. It, it seems like, like pastoring is the craziest job in the world because you stand up and give, you know, 52 times a year, you, you, you work out something to talk and you know that 51 of them are going to go, whoop, gone. But it's okay. It's what we do. It's life. It's like being a parent. You know you're going to say that to your kids. You know they're just going to go, yep, smile, nod, go, that was awesome advice. Then go and do whatever they want because they're kids. That's what they do. But here's the thing. As crazy as what it is to step out in faith on 
Promises God has not made. It's just as crazy to not step out in faith on promises that God has made. And I wonder how many promises, how many things has God got, has God said about you? What I would term universal promises. You are a child of God. Did you know that this morning? You're a child of God. Did you know we sung a song and it's true, you're no longer a slave to sin? Did you know that? So when you're battling sin, when temptation comes your way and you're sitting there going, oh, I'm trapped by this, how do I get out of it? What if you actually believe what God said and you started looking at yourself going, actually, you know what? I'm not a slave to that. Yes, it's a temptation. Yes, it's hard yes but but you know i'm not a slave it looks different trying to escape a cell from the inside than it does outside you're actually outside the cell now and the door's open so so your plan is a little bit different it changes your perspective how many of those types of promises are in there where god speaks about who you are what you have and so on what if what if we actually believe those and decide to put faith in those instead of trying to extend faith to promises that aren't necessarily universal and that God hasn't spoken to us. I wonder how different our Christian experience in our Christian life would be if we would just return back to the simplicity and the basics. And let's just get that right. Let's get that stuff right in our life. Who does God say I am? I don't think I'm that person, but God thinks I am. Do I get it wrong about myself sometimes? Yep. Has God ever got it wrong about me? No. So who should I be living like? What he says and who he calls me to be or who I think I am? It's amazing the little changes that can take place in our walk with God if we would just get our faith in the right places. Amen? Just get our faith in the right places. Again, I'm hoping that's for somebody. That's not what I really sort of the path I wanted to go down today, I feel like I've gone down a rabbit trail. But I just really believe that there's a word of encouragement in there for, for somebody. Maybe it's you young people. Maybe it's you young people. Jesus Christ hung on a cross and died for your sins. You're going to get into heaven one day, not because you're smart, because you get into uni, because you've got top grades. None of that's going to matter. You're going to get into heaven because Jesus Christ hung on a cross, crucified and died for you. Get to know him. Get to know him because he loves you. Your parents' faith ain't going to sustain you. It's got to be your faith. Amen? Anyway, let's leave it at that. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you, God, for each person in this place. Holy Spirit, I, I pray, would you seal in people's hearts what it is that you have said to them this morning, Lord? God, we don't come to church to be pumped up. We don't come to church to be hyped. We don't come to church as a cult. God, God we're here because we want to change. We want to grow into the image of Jesus. We want to be conformed into your Son. And we want to walk out these doors and we want to go out there knowing that God is bigger than I thought he was when I walked in the door. That he loves me more than I thought he did when I walked in the door. God, that's... Lord, that's, that's what we want, God. We want to be more like Jesus so that when we hit this community, God, when we get out there in our workplaces, our schools, our universities, Father, we can actually be what Jesus said. You said we are salt and light. We want to be that. I don't want to just know that I should be that. I want to be that. And I'm sure everybody in this room does too, Father. So, Lord, we just commit this morning into your hands. Father, I pray for each person in this room, God, those that know you, Lord, in the next seven days, in the next seven days, would you give each one of those people an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of God? There are people out there right now that don't know. Would you give us the opportunity to tell them about the goodness of God and how much he loves them? And Father, if there are people in this room still working it out, then Holy Spirit, I pray, just continue to tug on their hearts. Continue to open their eyes. Let them see the reality of that whole Jesus story. And God, let them understand how personal that is for them. That, Lord, you died on a cross for them as much as you did for anybody else. You love them as much as you do anybody else and you want, you want a relationship with them just like you have with those in this room that are bowed their knee to your Father. So we thank you for this morning. God, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.